So we're going to start. So uh, some of you are not writing your names on the music class exercises, so I have some up here. So if you get any class exercise, uh, looking at Paxton's Crystal Palace last Tuesday, but you're not finding your grades over there, please examine. They're coming. Why don't you raise your hand and ask that? Oh, right now? Yeah. Are there any questions about anything? Oh, yes. Gentlemen, please, nice and loud so they can hear. Stand up. Yeah, where are those other exercises? I have to pass them back. Do you need them to study? Hard to get them back to the difficult technology. Um, speaking of difficult technology, the sketch assignment, remember that? When is that due? Tuesday? Next Tuesday? Uh, anytime? No? What time? And how do I turn that in? <laughs> Why so many different ways to turn it in? You're kidding, right? I have to pass it in on Nuvu. I have to pass it in on Blackboard. And I have to pass in a hard copy. You're kidding, right? I have to do all Joke, right? In a way, but unfortunately, that's a system we've inherited. Apologies. Uh, consider it a uh, test, depending on what works and doesn't work. We will choose two of those three, possibly, for the next time. We're still negotiating. And I apologize for the complexity of that. How do I get to Blackboard? Who knows how? Who doesn't know how? Is there any problem navigating through this course on Blackboard? You already do it, right? Everyone, everyone has at least a friend who can help them get to the course on Blackboard. If you don't have a friend who can help you do it, you talk to me at the class. I'll get you a friend. Any questions about the sketches? Okay. What else is happening next Tuesday? Test. Test. 
I'm calling it an exam because just for the sake of honesty, quizzes tend to be, in my mind, a quiz is 15, 20 minutes, right? Who's with me? I mean, all the whole like hour and a half. That sounds like an exam to me. So we're gonna call it an exam. I'm gonna call it an exam. Uh, there's going to be, you'll, you see some review materials here, um, but you'll notice something strange about these, this review sheet. It seems to be a list of names and projects. There's a few concept idea base. Uh, items on this list. I did not alter this list. I inherited this list. I'm giving it to you unaltered. I recommend that you use this as a pretext. You should go through here and compare this with what we went over in the class, what you read, and identify those items on this list that were the focus of some uh, emphasis and detail in the lectures, not all of them were. And there will be a, like, Friedrich Gilly, for example, Monument to Frederick II. Did we show that in class? Yes, we showed it in class. Is it in the reading? Yes, in the textbook. Is it important enough to emphasize and make sure you understand it? No. <laughs> we did not focus on Friedrich Gilly and his monument. So if I were you, I would cross that off. Why would I not cross it off if I were you? What? Why not? If you found something fascinating and useful about Friedrich Gilly's monument to Frederick II, that is you taking responsibility for your education, you grabbing that, putting it in your pocket, and carrying it out of this class, out of this program, and into your careers. If it is something that resonates with you and you find it useful, then you don't cross it out. You uh, take ownership of it. There will be test questions that go something like this. Uh, Piranesi's prison lines invoked a profound sense of the sublime in his argument. Name one other project that is also intended to While your classmates are going, uh, 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 I don't know. You're just going to say, Friedrich Gilly's monument to Frederick II. Boom, right? Chaos. So if it's something that makes sense to you, that you find valuable, then you grab it and you take ownership of it, whether it's on this list or not, whether we emphasize it in the lecture. Or we pass over it, whether the textbook mentions it or not. This is you constructing your understanding of architecture and how the world works. Because, need I remind you, the world is the number one source of understanding, and it's your job to take ownership of your education. I'm just number four. Okay, so just because I think it's important doesn't mean it is, just because I don't include it on the list, doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, take ownership of it. Okay? So sketches, the review sheet for the exam, we're going to be doing some review. I've, I've uh, developed a series of review slides to help the review process. 
that does reflect the emphasis that I have been uh, placing and bringing to the course. Hopefully you will find that useful. The in-class exercise that we have uh, for us today is directly related to your efforts to prepare for the exam. If all goes well, this in-class exercise is also directly, directly related to my mission in producing the exam. Each one of you will propose an exam question. It could be that your exam question is chosen and will appear on the exam. If your exam question is on the exam, you might get it right. You might not, but you might. Does that sound like a good exercise? So, um, these exam questions are similar to the ones you encounter by Saul. It's going to be 15 to 20 questions. How much is the exam worth? Just so you can compare it with other things. Um, it will involve, unlike previous exams, it will involve identifying, I think there will be images on the exam. You'll see the image. There will be an image you've seen in the slides. And you will be asked to identify it. I uh, explain what the architecture does and how it does it. Now, this review sheet might be deceptive uh, into tricking you into thinking that the, uh, a really important aspect of understanding the history of architecture is what is the first and middle name of the architects? It's not. Don't tell anyone, but that doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, if you had to choose whether or not to memorize, to spend an hour memorizing the names and dates of the project and the location, or becoming familiar and more fluent in the ideas of the architectural project you're looking to work with and how they do it, which one should you choose? Which one is going to help you in your Second one is going to help you in your career. You may impress someone by saying Soufflo was the architect of the church of Saint Genevieve, which later, after the revolution, when they displaced the monastery and made use of the church, they changed it from Church of Saint Genevieve to Church of Canterbury, not the one in Rome, uh, but the one in Paris. You may impress people at parties, but that's not what we're here for. At least, that's not the only thing we're doing. That's a good thing. We don't mind if we impress people as your supervisor. But the real payoff, the real obligation that we are here to capture is a strong sense of what architecture does and how it does it. So that's the part I recommend focusing on. You might say, uh, in response to a test question, uh, this is the church uh, in Paris that reconciles the technology of Gothic construction with the formal language of classicism. It uses the techniques of Gothic construction of light stone weight stone uh, frameworks. Uh, but it doesn't have pointed arches, it has round arches, it has uh, classical columns. It is completely in the language of classical architecture, even though it's built using the technologies of Gothic architecture. I don't know who the architect was, so take away a point. But give me credit for understanding the concepts here. Okay? By the way, that is Soufflot's... Church of Saint Genevieve. So we want to emphasize 
what architecture does and how architecture does it because that's what gets you uh, advancing in the field and it what gets the field to advance. That's how we move the ball down the field. So any questions before we jump in? Uh, this is not just a review. This is also whole new lecture time. But while we're going through this, uh, I want you to think, ideally, about how some of the things we're looking at here might possibly connect back to some of the things we've seen in the prior four lectures. For example, in this very first slide, we see a new piece of architecture down here at the bottom that we haven't seen before, that we're going to talk about. It's going to be one of the feature stars of the show. Uh, but up there, we've seen this one before. It was a different photo and a different view. Does anyone remember what this is? And you're not going to know because you're the artist. So this is an example of the kind of question you might pose uh, in your in-class exercise and the kind of question that might be posed to you in the exam. So as before, these slide lectures retain all of the slides from previous years, even if we don't dwell on them. Here is an example. Uh, that a slide that we're not going to go into deeply. The only thing in red is that uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries, between 1700 and 2000, uh, the 1900s, there were a lot of new ideas about how cities and human settlements can be developed and designed. One of them is this guy, Charles Fournier, Balance today, uh, and nothing's in red. He basically is proposing a, a method of collective living where families, uh, hundreds of families, would live in this structure, and their children would be poor, and there would be a loss of sense of who's your parent. It was a lot like uh, Aldous Huxley's. where there's this utopian idea, and surprise, surprise, utopian ideas sometimes work best when packaged in the vehicle of visionary architecture. Where have we seen that before? Utopian ideals packaged in visionary architecture. Yes? In the salt works that show by, I don't know this person's name, But his last name is Ladu. So a lot of these urban visions had to do with the new transportation systems of trams. And so because a lot of people could move uh, long distances uh, on trams, this is before the automobile uh, took over the world, uh, the urban form there was an implication for urban form. This is uh, a diagram more or less of the streetcar suburb uh, model of urban formation. Where have we seen that before? Not in this class, but on the way to class. Boston, Brookline, Cambridge, these are streetcar 
suburb towns. They are shaped the way they are shaped, not just because of the cow paths that people always talk about, but because of streetcars coming in and out of the squares. Brookline is the quintessential streetcar suburb. And more utopian ideas like Ebenezer Howard's diagram for Garden City. So, uh, but the biggest single thing that happened uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution is the dramatic transformation of the city of Paris in the 19th century. And here's a slide that summarizes what the architecture, in this case, it's more an urban form design than it is an architectural scale. Uh, what did the design of Paris do, and how did it do it? This slide uh, will be in the review slides at the end of this lecture. Or no, it won't. There it is. This is the only time you get it. But these slides are all up on Blackboard. Um, so we'll go through it one at a time. So the first way that Haussmann's urban design for Paris restructured it and transformed Paris is it created a sewer system. This is the time when cholera epidemics were destroying cities. Over the past centuries prior to this, uh, cities would every decade or two, a city would typically lose one-third to one-half of its population to cholera or some other plague. And a big source of that problem uh, was discovered to be uh, waterborne diseases. Um, in London, they discovered that. And so separating your drinking water from your sewage output suddenly made sense. You know that the first rule of architecture? Don't shit where you eat. Right? Uh, this was a long time coming, uh, but finally uh, it was embraced as a principle of urban form. And so uh, it wasn't the first set of sewers, but it was the most dramatic and extensive uh, commitment. Uh, it became a tourist attraction. It was so. Uh, remarkable. Um, Paris was a place of, of revolution. The, what year was the French Revolution? Seventeen eighty-nine. Close enough. Uh, so, seventeen eighty-nine, the year the uh, Constitution was ratified in the United States, was the year of the Great French Revolution. Uh, if you've seen Les Miserables, this is right out of Les Miserables, the barricade. Uh, these episodic revolutions that plagued Paris uh, before and after the French Revolution uh, were in part uh, allowed to happen because the streets were so narrow. And so a big move was to, uh, there was a concentration of poverty uh, and working poor, and their, their narrow streets allowed those revolt, those rebels to build barricades across. So narrow streets are hard to, uh, to penetrate with your armed forces. Also, it's hard to move uh, troops quickly across town. So they widen the streets in order to move people more quickly. Um, Here's a hint as to how well that worked. This is a photograph, which didn't, wasn't invented until much later. If Haussmann's work uh, started in 1853, um, and the photograph doesn't come till many years later, here's a hint that it didn't work completely. Here's another hint. What's that in the background? It's Soufflot's Church of Saint Genevieve. So um, gentrification was another big thing that this design did. You identify, uh, and this is a time-honored tradition, uh, the 
they did France, they did before France, they did it throughout the colonial world. They did it in the United States very dramatically in the post-war period. Do you think there's any coincidence that that big freeway cutting through the center of the Bronx is located precisely where it is? No. Robert Joseph, when he was planning the interstate highway system through New York City, very carefully did a very similar thing that Hudson did. You identify the populations of people. First of all, you concentrate populations of people who you seem you deem undesirable. You concentrate them in very specific neighborhoods. Then, when you need to build infrastructure, you drive that infrastructure right through the heart, or right at the edge of those neighborhoods to disperse that population and create a barrier between what's left of that neighborhood and the next neighborhood. And so uh, there's a, a graphic rendition of that strategy without the uh, demographic identifiers of what populations they are trying to get rid of. But if you can get rid of the people who are constantly revolting, the working poor, then you can reduce the frequency and severity of these uh, revolutions. So the gentrification uh, has to, do, you have to do two things. You have to get rid of those people that you don't want in your city and move them out. Then you have to bring in the people you do want in your city. And prior to the French Revolution, or prior to the Enlightenment, again, in the beginnings uh, we've been talking about for weeks now, prior to the Enlightenment, it's uh, Loyalty, the monarchy, and the church, and you don't question their authority, and you just do what they tell you to do. The Enlightenment uh, brings the shakes up the hierarchy, and uh, you suddenly get the rising of what we uh, mistakenly call the middle class. When you hear the word middle class, you should translate that to mean wealth. It used to be there was a middle class in the United States, and it was very middling. Uh, but that, those days are long gone. So every time you hear the word middle class, you now have to translate that into a consumer class. Those people who have disposable incomes, who have discretionary incomes, who can go shopping, who can go uh, to the mall and buy things as a form of entertainment. Uh, and so this was a new thing. We take it for granted now. But this was a new thing in Paris in the 19th century. Uh, and it was reinforced by the architecture of the boulevard. Once you uh, knock down all of the slum dwellings, this is what you build in its place. And at the bottom floor, you have the kitchen staff and the services for the wealthiest families. On the second floor, what we in North America call the second floor, in the rest of the world, in most of the rest of the world, especially in Europe, what do they call the second floor? The first floor. It's like baby. Baby is so European. You go to the top for your gym classes and you say, oh my god, it feels like the sixth floor. And it says fourth floor. In Europe, it might be called the fourth floor. And remember, it's just being very good. But uh, this is this, the first floor is the piano mobile, which is up above the ground to what we would call the second floor. That's where the wealthiest people live. Above that, you get slightly less wealthy. These are apartment buildings. You get families that have slightly less wealth. And then you go up there, they're the renters who can have the black hat. He's saying in French, you must pay the rent. And he's saying, I can't pay the rent. Uh, and then in the top, you have Essential writers, artists, they're very, very cheap rent. The other painters uh, and artists are starving and freezing and uh, dying of heat stroke. So, this is a stratification of French society in an architectural form. And these apartment buildings were built along the boulevards wherever Haussmann's uh, transformation uh, occurred. And so you get this rising practice of strolling. And you might hear the French word flaneur. The flaneur is someone who strolls through the streets 
and take in the scene as a form of entertainment. Uh, but it's more than a form of entertainment. It's also uh, a method of class identity construction. You dress the way you dress. You walk the way you walk. You uh, are in a carriage or in some other conveyance or not. This is a ritual of class formation, which is a new thing in the 19th century where you have, with the Enlightenment, you have this ideal that if you're born a shoemaker, uh, you're going to die a shoemaker uh, prior to the Enlightenment. But once you uh, shake things up, anybody who's born a shoemaker can succeed through their own hard work and determination and become something else. And so this is a new situation that we take for granted in the United States especially. Um, in another version of this course, I'm not sure if you went through this uh, last fall, but uh, Paris and Vienna and London and fill in the blank any major European city was once a Roman city. Did you know that? So Rome swept through here and they established these cities on their grid. And so the ancient part of the city uh, settled first and then gradually as the population grew, once it did grow, it was the centuries of didn't grow at each end. But once the commerce of Europe started to, to rise up, the city would grow in increments uh, with new city walls to defend against uh, uh, military uh, hostility. And that's why the train stations are located in the ring, slightly away from the center. If you draw a line between stations, it's pretty much an outline of where the city walls, the defensive walls of Paris were prior to the construction of the train stations, prior to the housing annexation. And so that's a very interesting thing your ability to read cities, uh, especially European cities, uh, you can say, oh, the wall was, I know where the wall was. Uh, another thing, so train stations are something we talked about. There's obvious connections to the architecture of train stations that we talked about on Tuesdays. Uh, the new parks, this new gentrification of Paris, the new rising consumer class, uh, they had leisure time. It wasn't work, 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 80 hours a week in sweatshops. It was uh, your leisure time. What do you do with your leisure time? When you do go for a stroll, where do you go? You go to these new things called parks. Uh, and part of the way this also worked is Paris could not remain this tiny little thing that it was during Roman times or the next century, or the next century. It suddenly grew like annexation. It swallowed up the surrounding towns and villages to create a municipal area or a metropolis as part of the collection. So the modern metropolis takes form in part by gobbling up the towns around it. Where have you seen that happen? Yes, again, the answer is right here, outside of class, the city of Boston. The reason there's, uh, if you're looking for Harvard Street, um, there's three of them, or there are three Beacon Streets in the city of Boston. That's not because someone likes the name in the city of Boston and no one likes to Beacon. No, it used to be lots of different towns. The city of Boston, used to be something like a dozen or more separate townships. And they each had a Beacon Street, and as they were annexed by the city of Boston, now they're all Beacon Street in Boston. Good luck finding the one uh, that you need to get to. And what's the weird thing about Brookline? You notice how Brookline is kind of surrounded by Boston? Brookline said, nuh -uh, you are not going to annex me. And so that's how we got where we are. But in Paris, 
they had the power of annexation. And you can see the dramatic uh, transformation of all these boulevard cuts. And here's um, the key strategy. I'm not sure if you studied this last fall, but uh, when 1266 wanted to uh, establish a jubilee year and make some money for the other churches, he, uh, he used that money to transform Rome by cutting tax from one pilgrimage destination to the next. And so the seven major pilgrimage destinations of Rome became connected with these streets. This is house civilization several hundred years before Hausmann. Uh, and Hausmann took those tricks and he placed his major monuments, like this obelisk that came out of Egypt in the French conquest of Egypt. Uh, he pulls this monument and puts it at the intersection of streets so that it creates a visual access. Uh, it, to make the most of the pillaging of Egypt, always put your, your stolen icons at the end of the street so that we can see it and really celebrate it. These are landmarks of your city. And so that's what um, is done. And so you can see uh, the surveyors are probably just keeping an, a straight line of sight to the obelisk as they cut the boulevard heading towards that intersection. And so you get things like this. The, the uh, Arc de Triomphe, as the Cross of the Flower, the star place, the rays coming out from the center of the star are, the, uh, are all creating, it's not just a pretty pattern in the drum, it's a big impact. It works optically, it's an optical device on the ground. It's an urban design method to create a certain uh, effect on the ground. And so you put your major monumental architectures at these places of intersection, so you see them from far away, just as Pope Sixtus V did. And here's uh, a test case. We need to make an opera house. Here's the roof uh, <coughs> meeting the bottom in the river Seine. Where should we put our opera house? Should we put it straight, perpendicular to the roof, or should we put it on the sky? So they're testing those ideas. And over here, you get uh, an example of even the content uh, that was in the place is not spare. It's not monumental enough. And so the convent gets torn down in order to make way for the street grid. So here's a related item. Charles uh, Garnier's Opera House was one of the architectural monuments uh, that we saw here. Uh, in a, in a tricky twist on what Sixtus V did, the monuments existed and he cut his boulevards to connect the monuments. In this case, uh, the monuments don't exist and the question is, where do we want to cut our boulevards and let's locate new monuments in a way that reinforces the new boulevard. So it's boulevard first, monument second. This opera house is uh, the monument that is used to kind of organize the experience of the city of Paris. It's one of the examples. And so uh, I'm making a claim that this piece of architecture does these three things. And it's my job to demonstrate how the architecture does what it does. It's your job to be skeptical. It's your job to say, eh, I'm not quite getting it, or I'm skeptical, or can you prove it? Can you live up to Missouri rules? Where if you're going to say something, you got to show it. So I'm doing my best to live up to Missouri rules in the way I'm presenting this evidence. Um, let's see how I do. 
So there it is, the Paris Opera House. It's set up uh, very much in relationship to the design of the new streets. And you can see all of these apartment buildings lining these new streets. And then inside the block, there are mere fragments of the city that used to exist prior to the house immunization project. And these fragments get cloaked by the skin of the new architecture housing of the interior block is just left there. Uh, now you can stay in an Airbnb. It's very expensive, even though it was part of the slums uh, prior to house minimization. So here's this remarkable, grandiose piece of architecture. And it's at the end of this axis. And there you see uh, this axial view with the opera house at the end. It's like the opera house is acting like a magnetic pole that organizes everything else around it. The second thing it does is that it, it creates the infrastructure for the audience to take in a spectacle. It's the infrastructure of the audience and it's the infrastructure of the spectacle. In this hall, the audience is the big thing and the spectacle is paper just a thin screen. But in opera, it's more than just a thin screen. So here's the, where the audience is. It seems relatively small compared to the place of spectacle. So what is all this? Who did theater in high school? What is all that? The flywall. the opening in the stage wall, this is the stage wall. And so you have all these mechanisms up here for building layers and layers of scenery. What are all these mechanisms for? Oh yeah, that was all. That was to create the spectacle of ocean armies and people appearing from nowhere popping up out of the stage. And this tilt is a perspective trick uh, so that the audience can see what's going on from the full depth of the stage. So this is where the audience is, this is where the, the action is on stage. This is for filtering light. That's a pretty elaborate set of infrastructures. But wait, there's more. So if you move out, uh, this, this is one of the small spaces in the whole architecture, and that's the hall for the audience. What's all this back here? This is the backstage, the green room, the rehearsal space, the props department. It's where the reception is held afterwards. What's all this stuff up here? What is it? It's the lobby. Why is the lobby so big? What is the big deal about the lobby? Let's take a different look. So this is flipped in the other direction. Sorry about that. What is going on here? This is a good drawing. It's a sectional perspective, a very powerful way to draw. I've drawn it up to scale with the plan for you all. Um, but it has a people in it, right? So this is a formula for extremely effective drawing of the map. You see how people are using the space. Uh, I, think, I can't find a higher resolution. Virtually the images are also zoom in more. But there's an awful lot of people out here just so this is a giant machine, not just for taking in an opera, not just for producing the spectacle of the opera, but this is this whole section is what I refer to as the audience as spectacle. 
you don't just go to the opera to see the show. You go to the opera to see the other people going to see the show. And those other people are going to the opera as an excuse to hang out in the lobby and see food for two, uh, what are they wearing. Uh, it's the Facebook of the 19th century. It's the social media. It's the new uh, middle class, the new consumer class social rituals of seeing and being seen. And so this is the grand staircase that we saw in the first slide. This is the, the real theater is happening here in the new Paris. And the architecture is there to support it. These people are not dressing down. It's not business casual. It is uh, why they shopped at Bon Marche department store. It's to buy the fancy clothes to display and show it off to their uh, colleagues uh, of, the, of the rising middle class in Paris. And the people are dressed in full costume. The architecture is also dressed in full costume appropriately because Haussmann was working for Napoleon III, the nephew of the short guy, the military guy, Napoleon. He's the nephew. He was elected president. And what happens when you elect a shallow, egomaniacal, twisted individual to the presidency? Three years in, he says, I'm declaring an empire. I am your emperor. And part of the job of establishing the empire, the second empire of France, is who are you going to call if you want to establish an empire? You call the architects, exactly. Thank you so much. That makes me so happy. And the show doesn't stop in the lobby. The show keeps going down the boulevard de, uh, of the opera. The opera boulevard is an extension of the lobby. And so the show starts here as you walk to the opera. And you all come together in the lobby. Eventually, uh, you make it into the audience and see the show. But then it continues. You come back out into the lobby at intermission. And you do it again after the show. And then you spill out into the streets and boulevards of Paris. The weather is lovely. Uh, the cafes are hopping. Uh, and um, it's a wonderful life. That's why we went to college in Boston, because of the nightclub. So what's this? We've seen this before. Not that different. Is it a coincidence? Not a coincidence. The architects of the Hanoi Opera were replicating exactly what they had experienced and seen and done before in Paris. And one of my colleagues speculated in a wonderful book uh, that Hanoi and other places were not just uh, the hand-me-down locations of the second-hand design experiments of Paris, but the, the opposite was true. The colonial architects of the French colonial empire would try things out in Casablanca instead, in Hanoi. Uh, in the French colonies of Africa, uh, all over the world, and if it worked, they would then bring it back to Paris and they would build it in Paris. And so here is the establishment uh, under Napoleon III of his own style because he needs to establish a national identity new French empire. And he says, uh, he calls the architect and he says, I need to construct an identity for this nation state. What do you got for me? And uh, he said, well, we have the neoclassical. And Napoleon III would say, uh, what would you say? No, no, no. Far too subdued and rational and modern. I'm establishing an empire. 
And he says, well, I have some pockets over here. You want to try some pockets? No, that's even worse. And he says, well, it's out of silence. I have the Baroque and Rococo. I don't recommend it because we rejected it. Uh, Europeans have rejected the Rococo in the Baroque. But, um, and the Bohemian says, that's it. That's what I want. And so that's what he got. Poor Napoleon, though. By the time this opera house opened, uh, he had been kicked out of power. Houseman was thrown into jail for corruption. And Napoleon III's style never got had a chance because the empire ended in one of those bloody revolutions uh, before the Opera House was even finished. But the Opera House lives on as a documentation, as a monument to the hubris and excesses of uh, Napoleon III and this brief fluorescence of uh, the new French Empire. Here's a picture of Casablanca where just one, I could have chosen any number of a dozen different French cities and non-French cities because Haussmannization uh, was happening before it was called that. Haussmannization happened after that, not just in French uh, colonies, but it came to the United States. Uh, so I'm just foreshadowing something that's coming. It happened in Germany. Uh, this is not the best indication. But remember that church I said you can identify where the medieval walls are? Where do you think the medieval walls were before they were taken down? And remember, it's not enough to have a wall. You have to have fields of fire. Who's interested in military history? Okay. So you, you have a wall, you put your cannons on top of the wall. Right? Game of Thrones? Mm -hmm. You can't be firing into the woods. <clears throat> no. You gotta cut down the woods. You gotta have empty fields. So we would see uh, the troops amassing, and as far as your cannons can fire, you have to clear everything out. You need fields of fire. So you gotta take a little bit of time. Who wants to take a shot at where the walls are? So follow the big arrows. That is the general pattern. Um, but you can also see where they where they filled in once the empty space. Excellent job. Thank you. Great to see you. So whenever we fill in the empty Space, what do we do? What, what form do we use for the street? Do we do a cow path thing or do we do something else? We need a grid. So we fill in the empty space with a grid. How do I know? I walk down back bags to Strauss and Rivers, swampy and empty areas of the Australian East Coast, and they fill it in with a kind of grid. So they, they throw down the wall. You can see the edge of the wall here because it's where the streets make, you know, they go from being a mess to being more ordered and rhythmic. Also, they put set in these monumental buildings like you would find in Houseman Paris. And so this is the section that used to be outside of the city of Vienna. It used to have a, a wall around it. Up here and the fields of fire, and they just filled it in with all this weird like stuff. And so, Vienna is this remarkable place because of the construction that occurred 
after the threat of Ottoman invasion was done. Casablanca in Morocco. Slightly different situation. We have the Medina, the uh, original city. Uh, don't call it chaotic. Uh, you might call it organic. Very, very strict rules of Islam that uh, determine everything that's done here. You just can't decode it unless you go in the time. And then outside of the ancient quarter of Medina, uh, you start with your housing like construction here. And here you put in a bowl bar. Did you see the movie Ally? Brad Pitt? Beautiful scenes in Morocco. It's pretty believable. It's all of this Moroccan architecture. Um, and it's all French. You could be in Paris, but you're not. You're in Casablanca. And Hanoi. So we've already talked last Tuesday about the 36 streets district. Uh, I was privileged to be part of the team when the U.S. lifted its embargo on the drawings to consult with the, the, uh, the, uh, the chief architect of the city of Hanoi um, on how to develop a preservation plan for the 36 streets. They came up with this wonderful land financing strategy that I learned about from how uh, French and Germans did it in Strasbourg. Uh, but it's too capitalist for them. They just wanted to get all the rest of it. Uh, so they didn't have any money to preserve that. But here we see a similar situation where you have the old city of Hanoi, and then you have the French area. Where do you think the opera house is? How would you find the opera house? <coughs> That's an exposition. That's where you have the World Fair. Remember the Crystal Palace? And uh, so that's where you have the World Fair. And if you put your main building right on the axis so people can see it from a long way. That is an excellent guess at the point, but it's not true. Where would you put the rock house? That would advantage the building company in the lead. So you would put it at the end of some major long, it has a major long street. So what's that? Is that the opera house? Uh, it's too skinny. But that's a good candidate because we can see it along the way. There's nothing really located there, so that's not it. It's the exposition. This is too curvy. That's too much of a mess. Uh, here's where I'm going to put my train station because there's the train line over a bridge designed by different one not only was done in Brazil, but also in the United States. But that's the new French rail line. Look at where the train station is. At the end of this long boulevard. Very houseman like. So what other big boulevards do we have? Nothing there, nothing here. Right? That's just big diagonals. Nothing in between. Big letter lines. Nothing on the other side. So wait. That is the Opera House. And there it is. Did you know that? Who found it? Who knew that? Pretty good trick, though, right? When you look at the DNA of Paris and you understand something about Hanoi. And Hanoi needs to, uh, or the French colonial powers, they need to demonstrate their authority and power of the Europeans, just the way we saw in Calcutta. But they also want to demonstrate that it's destiny 
for Vietnam to be ruled by the French. And so they, they need to justify the French control of Indochina. So here they go. The architect. Uh, and so Gerard, who is doing a lot of urban design work in Paris at the time, is called upon to find a hybrid fusion between indigenous and French culture. So it's basically a French building of concrete, and, uh, and then it's, or not, uh, and it's clothed in a costume that is uh, informed by a decorative strategy of Indo-Chinese, uh, Vietnamese uh, aesthetics and forms from the the wooden, the wooden architecture of Vietnam is here uh, redeveloped uh, in, non, in other materials for this building. And I looked up where this is located. Where is it located? Now for something completely different. Uh, we talked, we've shown this slide before. What's in this slide that uh, we talked about? The bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge that uh, follows the world. Uh, it was still under construction at this time, although they're showing it fully built. Um, it wasn't quite that built at this moment. It's also pretty exaggerated in terms of, it's not that big. Um, it's in the slideshow. That's all I can say. The, each of these buildings is somehow a reference point, a potential reference point. The idea that you should get from this is there are some pretty big uh, buildings being built in New York City. Um, I'm not sure that date is right. And um, you can tell me why I might be skeptical of 1875. There's also parks. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted is a land the quintessential landscape architect uh, from Brookline. And he designed Central Park, he designed Prospect Park, he designed the Emerald Necklace. Uh, he's very a very important figure uh, he designed uh, this park, uh, the Fens, that is not just a park. It's also a major uh, piece of drainage infrastructure where the engineers would have just put a big conduit in underground and it would have backed up. He put in a landscape that actually performs in a much more sophisticated manner than the engineering solution would have been. Right? So it's, it's draining this entire area in, in major storms where a pipe in the ground would be overwhelmed by the volume of water, this is a floodable landscape. It's practically Dutch in its conception. Let the water take over, uh, and uh, that is a recipe for resilience, which is something we need moving into the, uh, the 21st century. So I'm skipping over the Boston part very quickly. Uh, the Boston parts of the collection, but they were made available to me. I keep referring to them because they're familiar examples of some of the ideas that were seen demonstrated throughout the collection. Uh, and so if you get a question on the exam, it says, Houseman developed the park system for the new consumer class of Paris. Uh, it was slowly and became an important part of the structure and infrastructure of Paris. Name another, name at least one other example uh, and how it works in a similar position to that. Well, you could say the Emerald Necklace. It worked the same way, but it did more. It was also a sophisticated piece of drainage infrastructure that could flood uh, under heavy rain conditions. 
boom, right? So there are many examples that I'm just glossing over that can be available to you, especially when they exist within our world right outside the door of the Annex building. This is something that does not exist anywhere near the Annex building. So remember that guy Thomas Jefferson who talked so much about uh, Robert Lee? Well, he was not just a slave owner, he was also a proponent of human rights, and one of those human rights was the right for white Europeans to march across the landscape and conquer it entirely. And it, it's not easy to do that. And so uh, what does he do? He creates a system of the war. And in 1784, to his credit, he says, any place that gets caught in the grid is non, a non-slave owning territory. Uh, and he established certain rules about uh, reducing the size of the slave owning territories of the United States. Um, and he creates this system uh, that is the basis for all land management to the west of the Appalachian Mountains to the present. And it becomes part of a system for manifest destiny for the conquering of the continent by the settlers, the white uh, Europeans. You see the first pioneers, uh, then the, the covered wagon, the Pony Express, uh, stagecoach, and then right behind them, there's the railroads. And you see the Brooklyn Bridge and the port of New York. And over here, you see the Rocky Mountains, and you see the savages being driven off the buffalo. This image has it all. I love this image. It's got um, misogynist vision of a woman uh, stretching the telegraph cables across the continent, um, as if this is an angel of the Lord himself uh, leading the Europeans across the continent. So powerful. And uh, everywhere except for Oklahoma, ex until it's time to have the Homestead Act and the land rush uh, in Oklahoma. And the grid also worked very well as a financing machine. If you were going to buy some land uh, really far away in the 18th century, in the 17th, in the 19th century, uh, and you would have to go visit it in order to see if it was worth the price that you met. Not if you have a grid system. When you have a grid system, you can say uh, it's a 40 acre square, like every other 40 acre square, and I'll give it to you for a dollar an acre, like every other acre. And you buy it sight unseen because every square is like every other square. And you can realize value in it and you can start to negotiate. And so land was being bought and sold in auction houses on the East Coast where the buyers never seen it because of the power of the grid. Similarly, if you uh, were in Boston or New York and you were going to buy a parcel, you know. Boston parcel is this by that, and New York parcel is 25 feet by 100 feet, and you put a five story tenement, same five story tenement that every parcel has on it. So, no need for an architect. It's cheap and easy to develop. So, the grid is a powerful system of replication. And uh, to finance the, the railway system across the continent, uh, you you give away the land on either side of the rail right of way. You give that land to the rail companies. They sell that land because it's going to be worth more because it's going to have a railway through it and towns uh, at every station, according to Jefferson's township arrangement. And so that land becomes extremely valuable. And that's what pays for the railway construction. And so you get this pattern across the United States 
the obvious uh, rail hub of the United States was St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, but because uh, but the rail hub in, uh, because of the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. But if St. Louis became the rail hub in the US, say, then that would favor Baltimore, Washington, DC, and the southern cities uh, at that time. And so the alliance of the northern business interests conspired and through huge promoting efforts, they promoted Chicago as the place uh, for the rail hub of the United States. And that's what this pattern shows. And you will hear the outcome. Basically, the rail system. And by the combination with the grid, which Jefferson, Jefferson realized and designed, became the system by which the rich agricultural lands of the Midwest, first the timber, then the agriculture, then the livestock, could all be moved across the landscape to Chicago and to markets all over the world. And so the Chicago School. The important thing to know about the Chicago School is that Chicago very quickly became extremely wealthy. Then there was a fire that burned down uh, the center of Chicago, which is then shown to you. But there was a fire. Remember that there was a fire. And Chicago had an enormous amount of wealth and a lot of commodities being sucked out of the middle of the, the middle of the United States, land developed a city, a new city, very quickly out of non combustible materials so that they could keep all of that wealth flowing uh, through Chicago. So it became this dramatic demonstration of how architecture operates as a machine for commodity extraction and wealth accumulation. And so here we go. They rebuilt Chicago. Uh, at one point, more than a quarter of all railroads in the world came through Chicago. It became uh, a very, very busy place. And uh, they celebrated the reconstruction of Chicago through, yes, once again, a World's Fair. If you want to establish the United States as a world power, and if you want your city, Chicago, to be clearly the most dynamic producer of wealth and advancement in the United States, what do you have to do? You have to call the architects and throw a party at an architecture place and invite the whole world to take notice of how sophisticated and advanced you are. And you need an excuse sometimes uh, when you're at the top of the hill in 1889. We know it was 1889. It's easy to remember 1889 because we all know the French Revolution was just then. 1789. And this was the 100 year anniversary. So let's throw a big party and blow the Eiffel Tower and establish Paris as the capital of the American rest of the world. But since the, the anniversary of it, 1892. Within a year, what happened in 1903? Before that, 1793, Constitution, Bill of Rights, and that. Okay, 1693, how that happened. 1493, 14, wait, what? Christopher Columbus. Yes, the Columbian Exposition. So it's the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus, quote unquote, discovery of America. Let's throw a big architecture party. Let's revive what's the identity construction here? What's going on here? What's this architecture doing here? What is this architecture? It's Napoleon III style, right? No, it's Gothic, right? 
topic, right? Who said topic? Raise your hand if you think it's topic. What is it? Is it? I hear no class. Who said no class? Yes, it's no class. How can you tell? The arches are round. Right? Is it made out of wrought iron? How do you tell from its distance? It turns out it's made out of chicken wire and plaster. Because how do you do this quick and cheap? Right? It, you put it up, you throw the architecture party, and you tear it down. And so after the fire, you got to rebuild the city as a giant machine of commerce. Who are you going to call? The architects. Where are they coming from? Everywhere. There are no architects in Chicago because it's a giant slaughterhouse. Uh, so you bring in all your architects from Boston, in particular, and New York. So Louis Sullivan is an important name. He was one of the prime architects of this endeavor. And he is exploring the possibilities of a new architecture that is an extension of the neoclassical. And they're using electric lights, and they're using uh, Greek and Roman form, but they're pumping it with steroids and making it bigger and white and beautiful. And it inspires the whole world, and it becomes the basis for the reconstruction of every civic center in the United States. The only thing we have here in Boston is Museum of Fine Arts is a direct outcome of this. San Francisco gets a new civic center directly related to this. Uh, Washington, D.C. gets another shot in the arm with another round of rapid development. One of the most dramatic transformations is the city of Cleveland. Anyone from Cleveland? Anyone been to Cleveland? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Is what? Your co-op was there. So that's Civic Center, right? So this was called the White City Movement. And it transformed everything. Um, this is just a, a, a smaller scale grid. So uh, we said first it was timber, then it was agricultural products, then it was cattle. Well, here's what happens when you pull all the cattle meat from the entire Midwest. You put them in camp. slaughterhouses, and that's made possible by the refrigeration. As soon as you have refrigerated uh, rail cars, you can, you can have a giant factory of, of gas, which was Chicago. People would go to the World Forum of Exposition, and the second most popular tourist destination was the Union Stock Exchange, uh, about a mile away. And you could smell it long before you could and they used, uh, they, they, they allowed the animals to walk up to the top of the system. They uh, hooked their leg up uh, and killed them. And the weight of the carcass would drive all the machinery. So this is how uh, premeditated the machinery of wealth production was, right down to the details of how it operates. So once again, we don't have time for this. It's in Boston. If you were going to do a sketch uh, to go deeper into some topic of this lecture, my vote was, you know, you have to spend time outside. Just go down to Topham Square and do the enamel paint uh, in composition of the Lady Bronze at Trinity Church. One of the most wonderful. So who is this guy? Henry Hobson Richardson. We don't care that his real name is Hobson. Uh, 
we call them AJ systems and all the AJ rigor systems. We actually don't even care who designed the building. The library in Cambridge, we didn't design it, but we call it Richard Sony. And he came around, he said, don't be neoclassical, don't be gothic, certainly don't be Napoleon the third stuff. He said, it's a little thing. I do Romanesque. So he's going pre gothic. Before there was gothic, there was Romanesque. We call it Romanesque because it's heavy stone architecture that's around our prior to the Gothic. And he uses very novel interpretations and extensions of the Romanesque. Uh, he's very good at uh, craftsmanship and ornamentation. He celebrates the, the polychrony, the multicolored different types of stone. He celebrates the natural materials. He lets the materiality express itself. It seems to rise out of the ground itself in some cases. I don't know if I'm going to that. But we love Richard Sony architecture in the United States. Uh, every year he surveys Trinity Church, Leeds, top 10 uh, at least. Um, what else do you know? He is considered to be the first original architecture of the United States. Everything else was derivative, is considered to be derivative. Everything uh, Jefferson did with the Bellagio. White City, we call it neoclassical, it was gothic. Everything was derivative of what they had had in Europe. Richardson was also derivative in that he was building on top of this long tradition that you studied last fall of Romanesque. But he is innovating it sufficiently and creating an asymmetrical composition. It's not here, but in these other works, these wonderful asymmetrical compositions that. Uh, it's considered to be an original American architecture. And here's some of that asymmetry in some of the work around Boston. Uh, he also did very large buildings. Uh, here you can see the thing to note here is the very heavy stone at the bottom, getting more and more uh, refined uh, and finished at the top in the nature of an Italian palazzo. Oh, there it is. There's the example. We're comparing the Palazzo uh, by Brunelleschi and uh, the, the Warehouse by uh, Richardson. We don't have time for Richardson, I'm so sorry to say. Uh, but he ended up in Chicago. So that's the segue uh, between the work of Richardson in, around Boston and the suburbs, and he ended up in Chicago. This is one of the more interesting stories of architecture, and it ties back into the Tuesday's lecture. It's connected with uh, iron architecture, uh, moving to wrought iron, moving to steel, because that is what's happening at this very moment. As a matter of fact, um, Jenny, William LeBaron Jenny, you can just, I didn't mean to make all that right. I think Jenny's the important name. He was very clever about engineering. He was supposedly inspired by a bird cage um, about how strong steel can be even when it's very, very thin. And so uh, in this quest in Chicago to build higher and higher, uh, he was one of the pioneers of using steel. Uh, first, he was proposing it be iron, but then the company said, iron is good, and it would have been wrought iron because there's no archways. Uh, wrought iron is good, said the, the supplier, but why don't you try some of this, let me hit you with some of this new stuff. We call it steel. You're going to love it. And so they gave him steel, and he was up. But moving to that part, the thing to note here is there are lots of buildings, lots of names, lots of dates, but the thing to take away, the thing to, to grab, take ownership of, put it in your pocket and walk out of here with, is that as the buildings get taller, they have trouble with the structure at the bottom. The structure at the bottom, because it has to carry so much load, 
keeps getting thicker and thicker. This is a beautiful building, lots of cast and wrought iron work in the interior court. Um, but here's an important reference point, right here. Look how tall this is. This building is supported by brick bearing walls. Up here, it might be two bricks thick. We call them whites. Two whites of brick thick. But as you go down, by the time you get here, you have to three. By the time you get here, you have to four. By the time you get to the bottom, look how thick the walls become at the base. What if you're a shopkeeper here and you want to maximize the amount goods and merchandise you can display to your customers walking by, you don't like this method of building. It's a problem. The taller we go, the more constrained it is at the, at the ground floor. What we need is lighter and lighter structure. And there are lots of interesting things about this, the auditorium building. Uh, it is another good candidate for your sketch assignment to explore more deeply. There's lots of visual material here. There are additional readings on Blackboard. Uh, there are a lot of slides here, so at some point, some instructor of this course thought it was a very important building. We don't have time for that, though. So we're back to Jenny's uh, innovations with steel framing. And I'm going to identify the fair story in 1891, because there's so many buildings are going up at the same time using similar innovations that uh, different people do different things. The reason I'm choosing this one is because the images are so clear. You see the first full steel structure right up to the exterior bearing wall. So you see that this is the structure of the building. And this wall is not a structural wall. This is a skin of brick and terracotta and cast iron, potentially, or some combination of all these things. This is where the skyscraper finally becomes a skyscraper, is when you solve this problem of structure and enclosure. You no longer have the monadnock problem of the thick brick base. The the base is actually the most open part of the entire building. And we like that because we like to sell things at the base of our buildings. And this is the key. You could study this drawing for hours and recreate it and still be learning stuff from it hours later. One of the important and sophisticated lessons that you shouldn't miss is that unlike cast iron, when exposed to fire, steel gets very weak. Have you ever been frustrated that you do all these great steel structures and then your instructor says, yeah, you gotta cover the steel? Well, no, that's the whole point. I want to celebrate the steel. I want to stress the, the, the form of the structure of the steel. And the instructor says, so why? Why do you have to cover your steel? It's very fragile in the fires. Steel will lose its elasticity. It will lose its strength. It will, lose, it will turn plastic. And uh, that's one of the things that happened in the World Trade Center. Um, and so you have to protect your steel with fireproofing. That's why there's sheetrock. That's why there's uh, hollow clay tile. Uh, they put the pipes and the systems below the wooden floorboards. Very interesting uh, sectional axon. And so we get to back to Lewis Sullivan, the architect of the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Lewis Sullivan, uh, the most important thing uh, to remember about Lewis Sullivan is to look at these images of his innovations. So he is working in the steel structure uh, idiom of all of the Chicago schools. He is also innovating 
what we do with uh, terracotta tile to clothe the steel skeleton. And there's a young man working in his firm by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright is internalizing all of these lessons coming from Lewis Sullivan. Lewis Sullivan, in turn, was an apprentice in the office of H. H. Richardson. And so we have this genealogy that moves from H. H. Richardson to Lewis Sullivan to Frank Lloyd Wright. And from Frank Lloyd Wright, well, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, you just have to tune in for the next episode. It uh, just, you won't believe it. People think of Frank Lloyd Wright as a dead end, but he is not. Don't believe it. So we have this remarkable exploration of what you do with, with all these decorative possibilities. And there's a, there's a building downtown, I just saw it the other day, that is, is a direct descendant of this. Uh, even though it was built in the last few years. So I want to now give you some time to write your questions. Because the next, the, the review slides are self-explanatory. I don't need to read them to you. And I don't need to emphasize because the emphasis is already there. Do you want to do it really quickly? Well, you go ahead and write your question, but maybe this, I'll, I'll scroll through these. I'm going in reverse chronological order. So last Tuesday we saw cast iron and then wrought iron. And we saw St. Pancras Station, the division between the train shed and the wrought iron. The Gothic, Gothic Revival in the front entry to the city, and then a, a, a bold and daring uh, connection between the front and the train shed there. We looked at Thomas uh, Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace. We looked at the Eiffel Tower. We looked at Vietnam issues and how iron, see Houseman. Uh, is mentioned in the Vietnam lecture. Uh, you didn't know who Houseman was back then, I believe. Maybe you did, but we're caught up to that now. We talked about steel, and we jumped straight to steel cables so we could talk about the Brooklyn Bridge and then bamboo, and the Neo-Gothic. And these slides are familiar and self-explanatory. What did Pugin do, both in his theoretical work and his design for the Parliament building? Le Bruce, we've spoken extensively about. Ruskin's ideas of craftsmanship and love of the hand. Violet Le Duc and his creative, uh, creative extensions of the Gothic, making up things that were never there before. And his advice to always show the materiality, use the extra materials and the spirit of the Gothic. I didn't mention this before, but I can say it now with greater emphasis. His 1875 trend, uh, treatise, Discourses on Architecture, were a very powerful influence on the Chicago School. He said, iron, iron is the future of Gothic expression. And those Chicago architects said, Gothic, Gothic, but technology of structural expression, we're all over it. Napoleon, Durand, Semper, Schinkel, Thomas Jefferson, Enlightenment, Diderot, Revolution, building types, the competition of the styles, which we've been talking about the whole time, the competition of treatises of the primitive hut. Is it classical or is it Gothic? Oh, I have upgraded this slide. Here's a new version of the slide. This, not the tablature, this radiation. Classical radiation. What is radiation? It's the division of structures into 
vertical and horizontal angles, columns and posts, round straight And it's the opposite of Gothic vaulting, which says there is no difference between vertical and horizontal structure, and it's just one continuous sweep of the vault. So Gothic, trade, Gothic vaulting versus classical tradition. Got it? You can try again, Judge, but it's if it helps you remember. Radiation, C. Vaulting, instead of D. You got it. Soufflot's Saint Genevieve. Piranesi's crazy prison. Visionary architecture of Boulet and Ledoux. 